Good evening. There it is. Welcome to Planet Word. We are the only museum in the country dedicated to renewing and inspiring a love of words, language, and reading. One more time for the cheap seats in the back. We are the only museum in the country. There it is. <laughs> Yes, my name is Britt Oates. I am the manager of public programs here at Planet Word. And on behalf of myself and the entire Planet Word team, we are super excited to welcome all of you to tonight's program, Eyes on Reading, Marianne Wolf with Emily Hanford. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to someone very special to Planet Word. Please welcome our journalist in residence, award-winning journalist and host of the renowned podcast, Sold a Story. Emily Hanford. Thank you, Britt. Thank you all so much for coming tonight. It's great to see so many people here. In 2017, I was browsing the books for sale at an education conference, and I happened upon a book called Proust and the Squid by our guest, Marianne Wolf. I had never heard of Marianne. I had heard of Proust. <laughs> I had had great difficulty sustaining my interest in reading Proust and understanding what was going on. And this was back in the early 90s before digital devices started to eat away at all of our attention spans. But I was interested in this book right away by Marianne Wolf called Proust and the Squid because of the book's subtitle, The Story and Science of the Reading Brain. And a quote that was on the cover from a Boston Globe review of the book. It said, Wolf has a profound respect for the beauty and power of the reading brain, as well as a great curiosity about the digital brain that may soon replace it. And that's why I invited Marianne Wolf to Planet Word to talk to us about what she has learned about the reading brain and about how the digital world is changing our reading habits and possibly changing our brains. So let me tell you a little bit about Marianne. She is the director of the Center for Dyslexia, Diverse Learners, and Social Justice at UCLA. She has written more than 170 scientific publications. When people talk about the science of reading, Marianne is one of those science of reading researchers. She is one of the giants in the field who has made significant contributions when it comes to understanding in particular why some of us have such a hard time learning how to read and what to do about it. But Marianne doesn't just write articles that are intended mostly for other scientists. She writes books that are meant for all of us. She is one of the great translators of the science of reading. And her books are full of references, not just to the other giants in the world of reading research, but to the giants in the world of literature. Austin and Tolstoy and Hemingway and Dickinson and Eliot and Joyce. Marianne comes to this work as a reader and as a lover of books. Her undergraduate and master's degrees are not in neuroscience or psychology, they are in English literature. In addition to being the author of Proust and the Squid, she also wrote the book Reader Come Home, The Reading Brain in a Digital World. And she is the co-founder of a global literacy initiative that is doing work in Africa, India, Australia, and the rural United States. And she even advises the Pope on literacy <laughs> as a member of the Pontifical Academy of Science. So she has done a lot of amazing things, and I am so happy that she can be here with us tonight. So please welcome Marianne Wolf. Thank you, Thank you so much. Oh, yeah. That's right. When she invited me, she said, we're going to have fun. <laughs> so this is up to you. Nobody can fall asleep. And in fact, if anybody does, I will come right up to you and say, good morning. That's what I did with my undergrads. Um, the reality is this is a very special, very special place. I have never been here. And when I saw Anne today, I said, as a member of the cosmos, I thank you for what all of you have accomplished here. It is near and dear to the hearts of everyone who is in this audience. So thank you so much, all of you. <laughs> you. 
And now we are going to go into 60 plus slides in 60 minutes. <laughs> so, and the reason why I'm gonna demand that of you is that there is so much that I, I want to actually give you in terms of background. And I think Emily, who is an amazing journalist, but also such an important disseminator of knowledge. I want to not only acknowledge Anne and all of the amazing people who are part of Planet Word, but Emily's work, who has single-handedly, how often do we say single-handedly? <laughs> she has truly made a difference. And when Margaret Mead talks about small groups of people, she proves it. So I, however, am not part of a small group. I'm part of a lot of different wonderful groups at UCLA and part of a collaborative on neuroscience, diversity, and learning across not only the UC system, but the California state system. But what unites all of us, and we're in very different fields coming together, linguists, neuroscientists, and lawyers, and educators, is the premise that literacy has to be considered a basic human right. I see it now on slogans and you know, stickers. I think finally people really understand this changes the brain. And that changes the individual's life. That trajectory of an individual changes a society. And that, in turn, changes our species. So it is never just a simple basic human right. It is the beginning of a trajectory for intellectual development, social development, emotional development, and I would even say ethical development of our species. So how in the world do we, and several of people in the audience have been writing me for years about this, including Adam, where are you? Adam Garfinkel has been writing me for more than 10 years about these topics, and I never met him till now. <laughs> I'm so excited. <laughs> it's like, oh my gosh. But he and I and others among you have been thinking, what are the implications of change? Because all of us know that our our ways of communicating with one another have been going through different great changes. But most recently, we are in the midst of a change between the written language as the basis of our communicative abilities to a digital one. What does that mean for us? And before I move directly into that, I want to set the stage, if you will, with a few of my favorite people, philosophers, authors, the Pope. <laughs> and I want you to begin with Charles Taylor, the philosopher. Possessing a knowledge is to be continuously involved in trying to extend its powers of articulation. And he was saying in way I mean, he used all these Humboldt and Her Herder from the 19th century before Chomsky, who did was my teacher too. I, you know, I don't want to put Noam Chomsky ever <laughs> behind this quote. But what he said was, there's a drive in us to couple everything felt by the soul with a sound. That should be a quote in planet word. Because that's <laughs> what we have, is this inestimable drive. And Herman Hesse has written about this so often. All life longs for a language. Deep intuitions wish to surface. Find words always evolving our forms of understanding. All the books in the world will not bring you happiness, but build a secret path to your heart. I want to set this context with some of our greatest writers. And I was so excited when Caitlin took me around the tour and one wall was this quote, though I have more of the quote, you only had a little, I have to say, a sound bite by Planet Word. No, 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 no. <laughs> but this is from her Nobel lecture. Word work is sublime because it is generative. It makes meaning that secures our difference, our human difference. 
We die. That may be the meaning of life, but we do language. That may be the measure of our life. And that's what I want to set as a context for how we think about language and its transformations. It is serious. This whole beautiful testimony to the word is just one of the exhibits. But I want you to know that you are walking exhibits. You are walking testimony to how important language is and how important it is that we understand that written language, which changes the brain, is being changed in a digital culture with both promise and threats. And that's, we never want to ever be binary thinkers. Our world is too full of polarization. That's not what we need. But we need, oh, and I, Naomi Barron, who, who is such a dear soul and friend of mine, was supposed to be here and couldn't because of illness in her family. But she said this, she was at American University, the real question is whether the affordances of reading on a screen lead us to a new normal, one in which length, think length, and what's happening in our students, and conceptual complexity, memory, concentration, immersion, and reflection. She doesn't know this. I added this last line. I wanted her to see that. And I have paraphrased her. I said it very carefully, paraphrased. <laughs> this is the joy of having colleagues who are friends. But this, <laughs> but this is alerting us to the questions of affordances of the medium. Whether we're talking about Marshall McLuhan or his student Walter Ong, we're talking about what are the affordances of different mediums. And although today we're talking about mainly two, the future is going to be full of different mediums. And we must be prepared with a set to understand. And I, I use this, the Pope uh, because he said this wonderful thing. Where the danger is also grows the saving power. That's the genius in the human story. There's always a way to escape destruction. Where humankind has to act is precisely there in the threat itself. That is where the door opens. Now, what he actually is saying there has a precedent that was done centuries ago by the philosopher Nicholas of Cusa who said, when we are faced with contradicting, seeming truths, what is it? How do we go after it? And he used the term that I think is so beautiful, learned ignorance. And that's what I want you and I wanted of myself to be using as the context for examination. It is not that I have the truth, that which is so hauntingly imperiled in today's world. No, but we need a stance of curiosity, of wonder, and of an intent to go after what we can know about the differences that different mediums have. And so what I'm giving you today in this context is a view from cognitive neuroscience about how we might add one piece of the great puzzle that will be evolving in front of us about those differences in terms of the impact of digital mediums. Now, as Emily said, we who are doing this work in the science of reading are much broader than what is typically being stated. Often in a popular press, people are saying SOR means phonics. This, we need to have an expanded understanding. And tomorrow with my colleagues in the Shanker Institute, we are going to be talking about the multiple aspects of the science of reading. But I want you to realize from the start, this is your last speaker in this series, <laughs> Stanislaus Dehan. You know, I've got to say, he is so eloquent, and he always says it better than I do. So I've decided I don't even paraphrase him. <laughs> I just tell you what he said. But he said it so correctly. Parents and educators must have a better understanding of what reading changes in a child's brain. I'm convinced that increased knowledge of these circuits 
will greatly simplify the teacher's task. Now, you and I have only a few minutes together, but I am nevertheless going to whiz you through a reading circuit. <laughs> and the reason why I want you to do that is to appreciate the beauty and the complexity that's involved and that teachers around this world, especially around our country, have so much on their shoulders to do. And now we want them to understand the reading brain? Yes, at a certain level. Yes, because that, and this was part of my conversation with Mary Catherine Brooker and, and um, Esther Quintero today, that is respecting their intelligence. And it's not that we're going to burden. It's that we want this knowledge base accessible, just as Stanislaus Dehan said, to parents, educators, policymakers. Part of my week was with policymakers in California. We need to know this so that we will not be polarized as we are too often. And Emily, of course, did more than most anyone I know to help us understand what lies underneath that kind of polarization. But the reality is that reading isn't natural. There are programs out there that hate me because they're called, <laughs> I shouldn't do this, but they are talking about even in their title that read naturally is what we do. We don't <laughs> read naturally. It is the fact that we have a new cognitive invention on our hands here. Literacy and numeracy are inventions, and the brain has to make a new circuit. That's beautiful, but it is a plastic circuit, and that's complicated, because that circuit is going to be influenced by the writing system, the educational formation, and many of you are involved in the educational system. We need to know this information, because the medium and the way we teach are going to have different influences. Now, I'm just going to just point out by analogy. I'm going to make you just make a simple analogy. If you look at the difference in what a very basic circuit looks like in an alphabet, and then you look at Chinese or Japanese kanji, you see differences in the circuit. Now, there's universal things that we share, of course, but there are differences based on the way the writing system demands, especially in Chinese or in kanji, where a, a, a fifth grader has to know 5,000 characters. Now, I always laugh at us because we are, <laughs> we have 26 measly letters <laughs> that we never stop complaining about. <laughs> and I always say that, and people say, yeah, that's true, we always complain. English is beautiful, but English is morphophoning. It isn't to be expected to have a perfect correspondence. So those of you who are moaning and groaning about the system, it's really quite beautiful. But the reality is that the system is going to be used, that circuit is going to be used according to the writing system, according to how that child is educated, and according to your purpose. The purpose that you use when you read will also have an influence. And that's a point that I want you to hold like a light motif in your head towards this talk. Now, the, the person that I, who couldn't be here, who's, who was at American University, now she's at Children's Hospital, is my beloved student, Catherine Studley, who's a cerebellum expert and researcher here in DC. And she did all of these illustrations, which I'm going to give you in one minute. Now, now I don't expect you to remember but I expect you to have awe at the beauty, <laughs> don't you dare <laughs> groan, <laughs> at the beauty and the complexity of what we do when we read. Now, I use this with purpose. Uh, this is a, how many of you know the Socratic method, right? Okay, how many of you know that the Socratic method came from Socrates' female teacher, Diotima? <laughs> Nobody, right? Nobody. Planet Word should have something on Dio <laughs> I'm, I'm making a lot of suggestions today, Caitlin. <laughs> Added something to the dyslexia, you know, all this. But the reality is that Dio gives me a chance to both give her credit where credit's due. It was her method. 
That's how she taught Socrates. But I use her as my example. I put him up there, you know, in his place, like in-house joke. But the reality is what we are seeing is the beginnings of that visual system that we use. Attention, that was the first slide, the visual system in all its beautiful complexity. And then we're adding the correspondence between that visual system, the sounds or phonemes of the language, and the other language systems. Now, some of us in this room really have a job on our hands to help people understand it doesn't end there. Dr. Butler and I know this very well. The oral language systems are essential to underscore as part of the reading process, the written language process. And so in addition to this very important work of putting the visual word form area and the integration in the angular gyrus with this set of linguistic processes. And when I say a set of linguistic processes, if only I could do more work on what semantic development. Don't call it vocabulary. Vocabulary is a, a pedestrian way of thinking about all the things that go into knowledge of a word. This, this building is the most amazing way of thinking about some of what, I'm using this as George Eliot, is really doing. Words are this uh, activation of all these different meanings, the, the way words are connected to each other the grammatical functions that we have lost in our teaching. And this is essential also. This is the only funny part of this slide. And there's very little funny in a neuroscientist talk. <laughs> so you have to grab it when you see it. Well, it used to be that no one liked to talk about morphemes. Now I was given a sticker that said morphemes are sexy. <laughs> Made it! <laughs> I'm really, really happy that this has happened. But the reality is reading in an English language is morphophonemic. You need to have this knowledge of morphemes and not simply prefixes in fourth grade. We have an enormously beautiful language system that we need to take seriously and add to it. And so what I, and then just because she's a cerebellar researcher, I put her her cerebellum in here, but it's really very involved in one of the most important aspects, and that is fluency. How all of this becomes automatized individually and together. And that's the reading brain. The reading brain is pulling together in this circuit of circuits. It's pulling together all of these processes, and then we connect them from automaticity, automatic, being able to put all that together with semantic and comprehension processes that I will call, lifting off the hood, deep reading processes in the plural. And here I do use Proust because he, he said things about written language in a tiny book called On Reading that no one reads. <laughs> Uh, you know, everybody thinks they have to spend 20,000 days, you know, reading Proust. I ask you to spend one day on this tiny little essay called On Reading. It is an absolutely beautiful piece of work. And in it, he said, reading is that fertile miracle of communication effected in solitude. Just imagine this. We are communicating with the author. We are communicating with the characters in our identification. But this is the most important point. We feel quite truly that our wisdom begins where that of the author leaves off. And you see, this is the acme of deep reading that I'm going to talk about for just five, seven minutes with you. But the acme is that place, Gish Jen, a dear friend and novelist, some of you know her work, said it's the place of interiority. It's the sanctuary. It's the place where we go when we are truly immersed in reading. And we can never, ever lose it. And we are. And some of you know you might even be here because you have lost somewhere along the line the sense of being immersed. Where did it go? You paused and imperceptibly you are not the same reader. This is what we must develop and we must preserve. And so this whole 
concept of polarization between methods of teaching, I would like terribly to help you and others. We are working so hard to bring these different polarized positions in the teaching of reading together instead of separated. And deep reading is one of our best roots of doing that. Not only do we need expanded understanding of foundational skills to include oral language processes, semantics, syntax, morphology, but we need an expanded understanding of comprehension, deep reading processes. This is uh, Alberto Mangel, who's an extraordinary writer who wrote a book in the late 90s called A History of Reading. He's the greatest reader, I think, in our century. But the reality is Alberto Mangel said that it is this geometric progression that we go through in reading where everything we read builds upon each other cumulatively or if we don't read, does not. Now, the whole concept that I always try to bring to bear in talks like this include the beauty of leaving ourselves I use a theologist, a theologian named John Dunn to talk about this, to pass over into the thoughts and feelings, lives of others. This is one of the most important aspects of reading that we have, the perspective taking of other. Now, some of you may well remember the um, beautiful conversation that Marilyn Robinson had with Barack Obama in which he said, you are an ambassador of empathy. You are an ambassador of teaching who others are. And she responded, the greatest threat to democracy today is the assignment of others as ominous threat. We have enormous privilege in reading. We have a weight that we can use stories as our way to pass over. And I love this one beautiful description. The novel is the closest to telepathy <laughs> we can come. Uh, but I love this Elie Wiesel, God made man because he loves stories. Stories are an important part of us. To love them is a part of our humanity. Understanding other epochs, other religions, other historical, other political perspectives. I look at Adams, Garfinkel's work. Understanding other political positions is, is an important, and, and never to just be content only with the silo in which we exist. Oh, here's our, here's our hero. But David Brooks said something. I always wanted him somehow to appear in an audience, unbeknownst to me. <laughs> he never will, I know. He wrote an essay, and I was trying to find it, in which he said, somewhere, someplace, sometime, beauty went missing. You see, beauty is what language does for us. And Marilyn Robinson wrote this beautiful piece in some of her essays, The Givenness of Things, that beauty is a strategy of emphasis. Beauty helps us understand if it's not recognized, the text is not understood. Who would think that we need beauty and don't realize it? Who would think that beauty's gone missing and yet it has? And that's part of the time that the brain brings to bear. So when I talk about passing over and, and analogy all of these are affective and cognitive. But then there's, where does aesthetics go? Aesthetics are part of the text that we must have time enough to be able to put together. Now, the penultimate, not the ultimate, the penultimate sum is when we put all of these processes together, the analogical, the inferential, the way that we evaluate the text all contributes to whether we can deduce this is the truth or not. One of the most important aspects to any of this work, and I can in and hope to keep your attention by sometimes telling you things funny, I'm going to be very serious this minute. It is essential that we do not let truth go missing or unevaluated. And we must do all our best.
Thank you. We must do all our best to develop it in children. So part of this work is cognitive neuroscience. Part of it is just being an advocate for our species, that we can't let go of our children's ability to discern truth. And the truth is fragile. Hannah Arendt said this, facts and events are infinitely more fragile things than axioms, discovery, theories. And then this most recent article, truth won't always win out. And the public sphere can't be contained. This is a lesson perpetually relearned when novel media technologies flood the information space. I'm not going to talk to you about the ways that a demagogue controls, but this is one of them. We can repeat, repeat, repeat a lie. Adrian Rich said, each conversation begins with a lie, and each speaker of the so-called common language feels the ice flows split, break apart. This beauty of language is fragile. This ability to find what is true in language is not ever to be taken for granted. And when we have all of this demagoguery handbook, repetition, arousal of fear and anger, over and over and over, truth goes out the window. Whether it's social media or any place, this is just, a, this is just simple. It's simple. And we have to make sure our children are prepared for it so that they don't succumb as many of our adults and their parents do. We have to help our species. So deep reading's ultimate goal is the Proustian pause, the place where our insights can have time. And time is the missing element when we talk about the affordances of different media. And we'll come to that in one second. But I want to introduce to some of you the philosopher Han Byung-chul, a Korean, an absolutely amazingly interesting, controversial, sometimes even contentious uh, philosopher who is in Berlin now. But he has said something so important that to me is right out of the reading brain. Acceleration is the cause of the loss of meaning that is threatening us. The furious pace with which successive images pass does not permit lingering contemplation. In other words, the ultimate goal of deep reading, lingering contemplation. The images only fleetingly touch the retina and do not attract lasting attention. No meaning bestows duration on the semblance of beauty. Thus one zaps through the world. The whole point is that deep reading takes time. And the affordances of different mediums have to be understood in terms of what time is given. Now, I want to give a context. This is a tough one. I think Emily has probably published this. I know the Shanker Institute and many of you educators have used this slide or a version of it. But the state of literacy in the United States has to be a major concern for all of us. Only a third of our children in grade four and grade eight, according to the NAEP scores, are reaching that area of fluency that is going to allow what I am calling deep reading to happen. One third, one half of our children of color are not reaching a basic level in grade four, unconscionable. Now, you know I'm a dyslexia scholar. This is not dyslexia, this is zip code. Yeah. We have equity issues all over the place that we must understand. But we also have other issues. I was talking to Adam right before this. Most of these children spend two to six hours a day on digital media, especially social media. 20% of the waking hour of a young child between zero and just early is 20% is on some kind of device. About 35%, you go up to eight to 12, 12 to 18, 45% of waking hour. Is that going to allow us 
to learn how to have deep reading. We have to really think. I don't have the answers. I'm in this strange place, and I've been there. Actually, what, what Emily read to you was what I came to as a conclusion in 2008. 2018, 10 years later, all the worries I had were coming true. And now the research, some of which I'm going to show you tonight, is even more. So if you look at this, 7.5% more time is placed in digital than on homework. The equivalent of 3.7 school months is what our 13 to 18 years old are doing. This is essential for us to understand simply in terms of the time economy, much less on what's happening to the brain. And that's where I bring a few of my poets. Where's the wisdom lost in knowledge? Where's the knowledge lost in information? And I come back always to, before I, I show you some of these threats, no binaries. We, we, we have to have an understanding that we have passed what I used to call the hinge moment between written language and digital. We, we are past that. So with Walter Ong, I say, and this is what his quote was, it's not a question of what does what, it's what do we do with children steeped in both mediums? That was Walter Ong's question. It's my question too. What, how do we do this? What do we do? Because every medium, whatever you're looking at, has affordances that make different requirements of that reading brain circuit. That's why I showed you that reading brain circuit. It was for a real purpose, and that is right now. How that circuit is being used in different mediums is the point. And the point that you see is that the purpose and what you read most, the time you spend most, is going to bleed over into the other mode of reading. I wanted to show you all these different aspects that are changing. But I wanted to begin by saying one of the things that is so important to understand is the changes in attention, the atten changes in a parent's attention. And Charles Taylor said this, um, the crucial condition for human language learning is joint attention. I just love the displays upstairs. I was just, just you know, these are so good, those babies. <laughs> But the reality is, it's all changing. I need you to know, it's all changing. Some of this work, very recently by the Singapore study, Europe is ahead of us. <laughs> They've been funding what's called the e-read network for years. They've been doing meta-analysis for years because they are so concerned about this. And I'll show you what they're doing. But this 2000, end of 2003 Singapore study is among Singapore, McGill, and Harvard, in which they looked at the relationship between amount of digital exposure and attention changes and academic performance. You already know that, I, just from my voice, how worried I am about this, because the more the exposure, the less the attention was, was, was developing in the ways that one needs for academic performance, and the worse the academic performance was the more the digital exposure. Now, that is our zero to eight. The e-read network has done two huge meta-analyses for our young adults. And our young adults have, by this point, we have hundreds of thousands who are part of these meta-analyses. And they simply, in the one hand, are looking at the same passage in print versus digital, and then asking comprehension questions. The reality is that the 170,000 young adults were basically doing better on print than in digital, right? But this is years 2000 to 2017. So then my colleagues in Israel, um, Ackerman and others, did a subset in which they just look at the digital natives, you know, just the very last parts. I'm going to ask you for a show of hands. How many think that the digital natives were better on digital and how many on print? So how many think on digital they were better on comprehension? That was the last part of the study. OK, oh gosh, maybe I've been too convincing here. <laughs> how many think print? How many think, OK. You are very right. And I was actually quite curious about this 
But the reality is they were even better on print than the cohort before. Why? So then Ackerman did this little self-perception. And that self-perception is they always say, oh, we're better on, on digital. We're better on the screen. And then you ask why. And here's the killer for me. Well, we're so much faster. And here is where we are really, I'm, I'm not even going to do this next meta-analysis, but it's a huge one on the amount of digital leisure that's going on with our, with our children and its relation to comprehension. But I just want to throw this at you so that now you look at adults. Okay, you're not going to read this. You're not even going to try. You may skim a teensy weensy bit, right? Because that's your day. That's your day. You are bombarded by information, and it's a defense strategy to skim. So we're, we're, I'm not, no, what is Marcus Aurelius says, blame no one, but set the record straight. The record is that we are bombarded with information, and we have to get through our day on screens, all of us, including myself. We have to do that because we have so much we have to do, right? So in the spirit of efficiency, we lose true time to read. We are using two major modes. One is a Z, so we sample, and then we word spot all the way down, and then we go to the bottom. Or we do an F. <laughs> but the reality is that's what we do, and that's what our college students do with their assignments except it's writ larger. They're reading the first page of the abstract, a little bit here, a little bit there, and they zoom to the discussion, missing the historical argumentation that brought that study its importance too often. Not always, of course not. But what we're, what we're seeing is that we are not just looking at what is the easiest thing to say, oh, it's, you know, it's how, you know, I could do it if I want to. The reality is Walter Ong early on said that these external aids make internal, interior transformations. That's the real point. And we have to understand what he's saying. Interior transformations of consciousness and never more than when they affect the word. Think of what Toni Morrison said. Word work is sublime. If I ask you, even right this minute, to think about any word, you have an incredible, it's almost like a, a, a talk about geometric progression of meanings that underlie that word, of associations. It's a, a bounty of, of beauty and riches that you can't have enough time to get to if you're skimming. And the more you're doing the skimming, the more you are changing the way you're reading on everyday events. Now here I use Italo Calvino, and he said this way before any of this research, but he was basically saying that there's a plague afflicting language revealing itself as a loss of cognition that tends to level out all expression into the most generic anonymous, extinguishing the spark, going back to Charles Taylor, extinguishing the drive that shoots out from the collision of words and new thoughts. We can't lose this. We absolutely cannot lose it. There are implications for our readers that are about these deep reading processes. They're not having enough time to really evaluate information for its truth at the level we need to, to teach them. There will be less time to grasp complexity. Without saying anything about your DC politics, I will say it was with horror that I saw Twitter being the medium for policy. We can't use that kind of reductionism if we are to truly be able to see the whole of the picture that's in front of us in the complexity of, of all the things we're doing. Very importantly, and I'm so happy to, to, to see that we're going to go to immigrant food. <laughs> I think 
that's so great. But we have to do a better job of understanding the place of others in our society as a just one more branch of who the United States of America represents. We need to have others as a piece of us. We need to have less susceptibility to this demagogue's handbook of repetition, arousal of fear and anger, and we have to teach our children not to be susceptible, and they are. Some of you know the Stanford study of undergrads. They were as susceptible as anyone else. So we have a job on our hands because all of this threatens who we are as a democratic society. This is where Adam Garfinkel and I have actually met over this last line. Because it's one thing to be a lover of language, it's another to be a lover of humanity. And how do we preserve that in a democratic society requires that we are faithful vigilantes of truth. We must not allow ourselves just to be numbed and numb to the seriousness of what we're talking about. So for educators, one of the things that I really most wanted for you is to remember for yourselves your love of language, your love of words. Every educator, I want to have restore who they were when they began to teach. I want our young to feel that they are doing something that's marvelous. Planet Word is marvelous. Language is a marvel. And I want our teachers to teach our students the life below words and how they change and there are individual differences. When I say there's no binary, there are individual differences. I want them to understand they have choice. You have choice. I, I take a Kindle on an airplane. I admit it. In fact, it's sometimes embarrassing when someone beside me says, what do you do? <laughs> I defend books. Duh. <laughs> You know, in fact, it was truly the most embarrassing moment. I had two men, and each of them were reading a book, and one of them turned to me and asked me what I did, and I said, you know, cognitive neuroscience. He says, oh, there's someone interesting. He talks about why you shouldn't use a, a Kindle. And I said, don't. <laughs> it's somebody in California. I said, Marianne Wolf. <laughs> it was truly one of the more embarrassing flights I've ever had. <laughs> Horrible, horrible. But the whole point is that we have choice. And I'm going to read you know, some novels I would be embarrassed to have you see me read. But I want to be done when I land. And so for me, and I talk to the people at Kindle because they are interested in how to do it better. I need you to know this is not a binary situation. We need to do, we need, and I said this in Reader Come Home, that the system needs to address its own weaknesses. So we need to help, just as you did, Emily, to help parents and educators have more information. We need to have this information out. And I see it very, I think it's a very important thing that I do talk to people in technology about all of this. And they ask me, you know, and, and I don't know what they will do with it, but they are asking, and that is a wise thing. But it also is the case that we want our students not to fall into this trap their parents are, which is you've got so much information, you go straight to the silo that confirms what you thought before you began. We need to have curiosity, but we also have to have guardrails. And I cannot do that. I've written the Boston Globe that I think we should have a board of retired lawyers who are grandmothers <laughs> to help us figure out how to put guardrails on what is the very difficult free speech and social media. We need so much wisdom. You know, I, I, I bring you these questions and I put them in your lap, but I want you to think about this, especially you who are in DC have so much influence over what happens over the rest of our country. So we want to have our students be 
able to perceive beauty, to be reflective. We want them to have what my colleague Steve Pinker calls habits of mind in a post-truth. And what he also said, and it was, it was contentious for some, sometimes we can hold people to a higher standard. Yes, we can. They can be taught to spot a deep problem across its superficial guises. They can be goaded into applying their best habits, and they can be inspired to set their sights higher than collectively destructive goals. I, my last ones are, what do we do with our children that is close at hand? And I look at this as a time of preservation and expansion. Expanding our understanding of foundational skills, expanding our understanding of deep reading, and also expanding different proposals. This is only one proposal that I made in this book, but it was, we know print is good. We have evolving understanding that digital for this early period has negative sequelae. Therefore, in the first 10 years, my proposal, and it will be changed, it will evolve, between 10 and 12 years is teach deep reading along with whatever else you're doing, but teach these deep reading processes on print. Supplement it, complement it with digital games for automaticity. Complement it with information. Complement it by having these children adept at coding and, and programming. Reggio Emilius, that some of you have seen before in Italy, they are doing a beautiful job of helping them understand the beauty of technology at the same time understanding how important print is. And so we, uh, there's, I'm just using my own program as an example, but what I, I really want are multi-component instructions and in interventions out there so that whatever we're doing well, and we're doing a lot of things well with systematic explicit phonics, and I have colleagues here who are doing some of that work, and beautiful bravo to you both. I, I'm good. Bravo, bravo. There are different people who are doing different things. But I suggest to all of you that the reading brain is essential to take into consideration, especially for our children who are struggling. And they are, they are mine. And so I, we have been doing a program that is, in essence, putting together science and deep reading in what I'm calling a biliterate brain. But in my multilingual groups, a biliterate brain is reading in different languages. I'm using it in a very particular language sense, a tech language, if you will and a print language. Um, this is just an example of what we're doing with deep reading. I do this for those of you who know your Latin. This is a terrible use of Latin. <laughs> but it's try thinkosaurus lex. And T lex, I'm trying to use this for first, second, third graders to know that they think ahead, you know, prediction strategies. Think back over plot, setting all the characters, in, but very importantly, right in the middle, Think for yourself. What is it that you are bringing to bear? Be, be empowered with your knowledge, with your first language, your second language, your third language. Bring it to bear. And from the start, do not wait for deep reading for adolescence. Let us begin from the start. And here I will end with Martha Nussbaum, another philosopher, who said this years ago. But I just want to use her because she said something so important. It would be catastrophic to become a nation of technically competent people who have lost the ability to think critically, to examine themselves, and respect the humanity and diversity of others. What I wish for you is a set of insights from today's very quick one hour with you feels like the flying nun, except I'm definitely not a nun. <laughs> this is a lifespan approach. We want our children, our students, our young adults, we want us to not forget the quiet eye that can perceive beauty and others, never as ominous, but is to enrich our lives, to understand that there are threats to empathy that are ongoing right now. There are grave threats to critical analysis, or we wouldn't be as polarized as we are. 
And never forget that inside you is this Gish Jen's word, place of interiority for our own Proustian best thoughts. And also that we have choice. And I do not want you to read a cheap novel for deep reading. <laughs> Please, just use your Kindle or whatever you use. <laughs> and with my blessing, but when it is important or when it is an example of something that you really need to go under, think about your own choices and think about how the making of those choices is actually influencing the way you will read not just that moment, but the rest of your time. And so I, I will end with this wonderful group. This is all, this is not even all of us, but it's a wonderful group of people. And I end it with both Marilyn Robinson and Neil Postman. The greatest test ever made of human wisdom and decency might very well come to this age, to us. We must teach and learn broadly and seriously. And finally, 40 years ago, Neil Postman said this, children are the living messages we send to a time we will not see. I thank you so much for inviting me. <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh, my gosh. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, come on up. Oh, come on you up. like Oprah? It's not like the stage. <laughs> I fall off the stage. Yeah, no, I'm glad. I'm and glad you, you were didn't the one fall I'm off the stage. I worried about if I did. <laughs> <laughs> Your wife is sitting right there. <laughs> I can't believe you did 65 slides, Marianne. And actually, it was less than an hour because we started. You didn't start till like 7:15. That's okay, remarkable. Thank you, thank All right, you, thank applause. You. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. That was fascinating. Um, and I have a few questions to ask you, and then we want to open it up to all of you because I'm sure there are questions out there. Um, I was listening to an episode of the Ezra Klein show recently. <laughs> I loved it. Well, and yeah. first, well, actually, I'm not even talking about the one you were on. So I, Marianne was on the Ezra Klein show, I think, at the end of 2022. But he did it two times in 23 oh, November. Yeah, he, re 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 he replayed re it. He, that was my favorite, that he replayed so it. So you were one of his favorites. When Ezra goes on vacation and he plays you again, you are one of Ezra's favorites. That's a great episode. So you can, it's on the podcast feed twice. Um, but this was a more recent episode that I was listening to, and he said um, it was a it was a it was a, it was an episode about trying to get our focus back. You know oh, how we're doing okay. that. Yeah. And he said, "I'm convinced that attention is the most important human faculty. Mm -hmm. Your life, after all, is just the sum total of the things you've paid attention to." Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I've been thinking a lot about that, beautiful. and you said that yeah, exactly. It's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to, I, I guess I want to ask a few questions just probing a little bit more about how this, mm -hmm. like about education and like what educators and parents like can and should do. And I know you don't want to be the person giving advice and you don't have all the answers and mm -hmm. I'm with you because people ask me for answers and yes. advice and I don't have them, yeah. have it. But mm -hmm. um, so I got this email a few months ago from a high school science teacher. Ah. He wrote, it is extremely hard to get students to engage with the actual act of reading line by line, mm -hmm. paragraph by paragraph. Mm -hmm. They stare into space or skim and wait for someone to tell them what to do. They will throw up their hands and say they don't get it. Mm -hmm. The act of deeply engaging with text to work through it word by word and mm -hmm. rest meaning from it seems to be foreign to them. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I think I found in my reporting is that mm -hmm. some of these kids mm -hmm. are, are for sure having difficulty reading the actual words, right? They yeah. can't engage because the text itself is like an actual barrier, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But I think one of the things I think about a lot is even if we can fix the problems in mm -hmm. early reading instruction to make sure that all kids can read the words, there's mm -hmm. still this big lurking growing question of whether kids will read mm -hmm. um, and whether they can engage deeply with text. Mm -hmm. So what would you, this science teacher mm -hmm. was writing to me for advice, basically. Mm -hmm. So what would be your advice? Like what, what can one teacher do mm -hmm. who's facing students like that? The first thing I would say is you are not alone. 
if I would just count the emails that I have from teachers just like that teacher, if I would count the emails I have from surgeons, from doctors, from architects, all of whom are saying that their students are not able to read dense material, especially if it's lengthy. And one of the things that is really happening in English departments is that the assignments are becoming shorter and shorter, that you're giving short stories and you're avoiding the 19th century <laughs> and early 20th century. <laughs> our, you know, our foundation, you know, as, as someone who thinks about Middle March and Brothers Karamazov and Anna Karenina as three pillars of my life, it is hurtful to think that this group of students will not have that opportunity to try on the lives of, of, of people who are amazing, but amazingly different in times that were amazingly different. But length is a piece of the struggle that your science teacher is having. They are having a, a complete, uh, the skimmer is the way they have begun to read. Now, part of the problem is that they are also not, uh, this, this is, this is going to sound very, very odd. For, uh, Carol Chomsky was my teacher. Noam Chomsky was my teacher, too, but really it was Carol, his wife. And what she was also always saying is that syntax develops, and people aren't teaching it. And we have students who don't understand grammatical complexities, growth over time. And so when they come to these words, it's not the words, it's the phrases, it's the clause structure, they're gone. You know, I, almost, I almost show my favorite sentence from Middlemarch, in which some of you might remember Dorothea in Rome in her honeymoon. And she's discovering that Mr. Kozabam is full of hot air. It's a terrible moment. And the sentence goes like this. It goes, and here she saw in the great vistas and labyrinths that she thought occupied her husband's mind were filled now with nothing. Well, it's, it's, best, it's much better. <laughs> I mean, talk about it. paraphrasing Naomi Barron. Paraphrase George Eliot. Please forgive me. But the reality was it required great syntactic knowledge to be able to follow that and to see that the very syntactic structure of the sentence mirrored the horror of her realization. It's where language, understanding how language works, and I really, I really mean it. When I talk about this, this, this small intervention, Ravo, for young children who are struggling, I am making sure they understand syntax because that's a block to understanding connected text, which translates years later into this student who never had this full appreciation. And so if I were the teacher after saying, you are not alone, I would ask him, if it is a him, think of, yes. um, to think about it as a developmental progression through the year. Not to have expectations that are impossible, but to incrementally tease them as uh, an exercise. Here's, here's a simple version. Now, next week, I'm going to give you a slightly harder version. And by the end of the month, I promise you, you're going to be able to read differently. But he will have to choose texts that are gradual, that are really helping um, do what that student never did. Now, I have to say, this student is like everyone. We, we are seeing this. Uh, one of the studies that I, didn't sh that I showed you briefly from the e-read network showing how that the kids are not doing leisure reading of print, that the leisure reading is all digital. So what's happening is that the, the, the combination of not having that kind of leisure reading is affecting their comprehension. So the other thing I would do is to have fun science stories and begin with, with stories. Sometimes he might even have them assigned to write a story, you know, about God knows what. You know, but to have them involved in the process, they, it's not their fault. You know, this is the thing. We, 
it, it's, I'm, no, I'm blaming, I'm really serious, I'm blaming no one, but here we are. So what, what can we do about it? We can, I, I, I'm gonna begin with the young, fine. But I, I'd say that the teacher of a high school student has a lot to, to do now that they didn't if they are, as Steve Pinker said, to have higher standards. Now here's another issue that just kills me. You know who reads all those books? And I, I'm sorry I'm gonna step on toes. There's not an audience whose toe you know, quota isn't stepped on. <laughs> Our private schools are doing a really still good job of getting those classics read by everyone. People always have talked to me about, oh, as you're, as you're thinking about deep reading, isn't it elitist? No, it's the opposite. I want everybody to know how important it is for everyone. And not as my, and I have spoken in, in Silicon Valley, and after my talks, people will come afterwards and say, don't worry, my child's not on a screen. <laughs> right. You know, my child's reading books. <clears throat> yeah. Right. So what I tell this science teacher is that find a way to bring story and science together. I really believe in the integration of science and story as a way to help our children come back. Yeah. Come back. Well, uh, so, okay, so one more question for me, and then we're going to go to the audience. But what do you think, you know, one of the things that's happening now, there's been a wave of legislation banning uh, cell phones oh, in yeah. schools. Yeah. So what do you think about that? Should, is that something schools really should be doing? You know, you can always do the right thing for the wrong reason. And it's banning cell phone during the school. Okay, you can fine, but you believe then you have, you have fixed the problem. The cell phone is not the whole problem. It's a manifestation of a larger problem. It's what is underlying the use of that cell phone. Are they on digital media the whole time? Is it used for emergency? Is it used for, you know, my, my colleague, uh, Catherine Steiner Adair, wrote a book called The Big Disconnect in which she connects it to this, the changes in attention. The, she's a clinical psychologist, and so she's really looking at the social emotional aspects of it. There are social emotional aspects to cell use. There are cognitive intellectual aspects to use. What, how can we instruct our children on the good uses of the cell phone and not just make it a punishment and never make it a reward? I mean, that is a real, that's really, really no. Don't just take them away. That's about, that's not gonna work. Mm. But you can't, so I, so I even have a slide for my colleagues at Shanker Institute tomorrow in Montgomery County, in which I say it's not phones versus phonics or science of reading. It's understanding what is not happening with phone use. That is what the legislation should be about. How do we really inspire reading, inspire deep reading, and inspire the good use of technology? Digital wisdom is not going to be served by simply banning a cell phone. Thank you. Okay, so, so we have just, I think we have about 10 minutes. Um, who has a question? There are some people in the microphone. Uh, okay, so I guess it's gonna be up to whether you can get the attention of someone with a microphone. There's a couple of people in the front, there's one person in the back. Okay, hi. Hi there. Thank you for being here, Dr. Will. Thank you. Um, my question is, do we know specifically what happens in the brain when, reading, when children are reading the same text digitally and in print and the, comp the comprehension deficits? Why is that happening specifically in the brain? Okay. Um, when I said this is an evolving knowledge, we have some really interesting studies coming out of uh, the Teachers College even just right now. We have a lot of <coughs> neuroscientists who are hard at work on trying to do just that. Some of them, there was a Stanford study as your brain on Jane Austen, for example. Mm -hmm. And what you do see is that there are areas when you are deep reading, they, they use graduate students, these were college student level. And what you see is that they are using Let's just take one example of an area of the brain 
that can be or is not used depending on whether you're using deep reading or what they call close reading actually in this study. Mm -hmm. And that was the motor cortex, believe it or not. And so the motor, let's, let's, and I use the example Anna Karenina right before she committed suicide. You know, on the train, she had her big red bag and she leaped into the tracks. And what you are doing is with your motor cortex, you are leaping. You are so involved. When I talk about understanding others, you are, under, you are truly identifying in ways that your brain is, in fact, changing. Now, there are much more sophisticated areas that are involved in the inference, in the comprehension, and that's the sort of study that some of my group, Rebecca Gottlieb in particular, were trying to pursue that. But yes, we are in the beginning, and I, and I call this a frontier. You know, w w the, the horrible thing for me, I'll just say it, um, is that we're behind. <laughs> uh, innovation is ahead of knowledge in this area. Uh, we're doing more and more. And there's uh, the, the, the French, um, he, he, he wrote um, Desmerger, I, I'm pronouncing his name, in tw December 2023, his book uh, on these issues gave, for those people who want to look at that research, he analyzes the research that exists right now. And there's quite a lot of it. There's much more that's coming. But yes, we are beginning, but we are behind. And it's what um, my colleague at MIT, Sherry Turkle, said. We don't make a mistake because we innovate. We make a mistake when we do not ask what our innovations diminish or disrupt. Yes. And that's what I want us to be closer and closer. That's why I literally am having talks with Google and Kindle um, at Amazon to really say, you know, he, here's your body of knowledge, here's my body of knowledge. How do we do a better job if our mutual goal is not profit, but our <laughs> mutual goal is the species? Yeah. Uh -huh. Thank but you. I believe there are really good people in technology. My son worked for Google for nine years, so full <laughs> disclosure. <laughs> okay, another question. Does someone have a right microphone? Here. Okay, Hi. go ahead. Um, Hi. Could you speak a little bit about audiobooks and whether it's possible to do deep reading with audiobooks? Yeah. Uh, I'll bet you, how, how many of you use audiobooks? Let's just say almost all. Right. I mean, let's face it, it's wonderful. <laughs> I use it, and if there's a commute, you know, to UCLA, oh, my God, thank the Lord for an audio book. But is it the same? No, of course not. Every medium that I'm talking about has different affordances. And one of the important aspects of print is it allows what's called comprehension monitoring. Now, I'm not saying you can't go back and rewind. Now put your hands up. How many of you have been rewinding regularly? Ooh, not bad. Actually, that's very impressive. I'm serious, that's very impressive. Because the reality is that most people don't rewind and monitor their comprehension. And that's a piece of it. And so one of the other aspects is the, the comparison with film. With I love the multiplicity of mediums, especially for different individuals. My first child is dyslexic. And how many of you think he's read my books? <laughs> how many of you think he's done them audio? <laughs> my last book, he said, Mom, I've got the title. The editor was really mad. He's, I said, what's the title? She said, TLDR. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, too, too, too long didn't read. Or don't read. <laughs> but he, he, he is absolutely reading Brothers Karamazov because he knows it's one of my favorite books. And so he will spend a summer reading it. But he will use audio books and has used them all his life, basically, in ways that I think are very productive. So it's not a, there's no ban I have to make on any medium, no ban. And I love audio books for, for particular things. But again, if I'm really serious about something, the audiobook will not do that for me, especially with my desire for notation of a particular sort. It's fascinating that you say that I was going to ask you a question about this too, because I find, as someone who produces and consumes a lot of podcasts, yeah. 
that that feels to me in the digital world we live in now one of the places where I have the most deep focus now oh, because I can walk away from my computer I put yeah. it's on my phone and I tend not to get distracted and I mm -hmm. I can remember like certain things I was hearing in a certain podcast at the mm -hmm. stop sign at the end of my yes. street and, yes yes um, yeah. But it's also interesting because I've I, so I listen to podcasts. I've mm -hmm. never much been mm -hmm. into audio books yeah. because I actually think that books read on audio it, suffer from exactly that problem because mm -hmm. they're not written to be read out loud. Mm -hmm. They're written to mm -hmm. be read. And as someone who makes podcasts, you write very differently <laughs> For if that. you're trying to write mm -hmm. in order to prevent someone from having to back up. Yeah, that's exactly what we're trying to do. Interesting. Then you lose them. Yes. They, and then they're like, well, I don't want to listen to the rest of that. So you have yeah. to keep writing. So like. That's don't so hit the back button. So you just have to keep someone with you. I've never but heard anybody say Jane this. Austen doesn't write that way. <laughs> Jane Austen yeah. writes like, let me go back here and remind myself what's going on. Who is this? It is a universal. No. <laughs> yeah. Next question. Um, I, someone I think has the microphone. Yep. Thanks. Hi. I, oh, I have a question. I, um, I oh. work with teachers and uh, mm -hmm. reading specialists in DC and mm -hmm. train around how to support struggling readers in particular. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I had a question recently that I thought was really interesting from a K-2 reading interventionist mm -hmm. who works with students with dyslexia and struggling mm -hmm. readers. And she said, I'm noticing that they don't have as much working memory as they used to. Mm -hmm. And I, my response was, have you read Reader Come Home? <laughs> and like this may be, like I'm wondering if it's actually attention. Mm -hmm. But I'm curious if in your, in your research, if you've looked at mm -hmm. working memory and yeah. shifts in working memory or even just like mm -hmm. the uh, comorbidities of working memory and dyslexia and mm -hmm. attention um, okay. at all. You, you've got three questions at least in that <laughs> one, <laughs> which I love. Sorry. Which I love. It's such a complex set of issues. I'm going to handle them. I'll at least do two. The first is that every dyslexic child is like every child. They are all suffering from a difference in the sequelae of distraction. Our kids are are so distracted and so distracting when they are doing different things. So that there is, no matter what age, we're talking about some differences in working memory <coughs> all the way into adulthood. So let's just start from that, that they're going to be affected too by digital culture's change on working memory, period. Number two, and much more to the point of your discussion, is that, um, and I was talking about this um, at lunch, because there are very different <coughs> subtypes of dyslexia than are commonly understood. In fact, I talked to Caitlin about changing your dyslexia. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, just because one of them is just exactly uh, pertinent to your point. Some of the big uh, analysis that our group did when I was in Boston was with John Gabrielli's MIT lab and Olaf Ozernoff Palchik, all these people. We all studied five year olds, six year olds, and found that there is a group that have phonological, which we always think about with dyslexia, but they have memory issues. And so that subgroup has. M has pronounced memory and phoneme awareness issues that go together with the executive and attentional network. That's a small subgroup, about 20. The largest percentage of kids, however, is about 75%. That group has memory issues, attention issues, phoneme issues, and very importantly, and this is the always it got, is, is, is too often un, misunderstood, the speed or processing speed with which orthography or writing letters and sounds are coming together is its own small subtype that's as large as the pure phoning subtype. So you have two pure phoning type. We, you can call it the RAN, full disclosure, Martha Dinkla here at Johns Hopkins, and I created the RAN. She was the first. Kelly, you know all of this. I look at you and I think, oh, Kelly could say this better. But the reality is the RAN weakness, which is identified, is an index of later fluency issues. It doesn't have those memory issues. So you see, but the largest group has multiple areas of weakness, phoneme awareness, RAN deficit, 
memory issues, and sometimes they have what Jason Yateman calls uh, a visual a processing problem that's probably in what is called the, the visual word form area. He's doing some of this work, and that's, that's research out of Stanford that is very little known by people. But this, the more commonly is this, this, these tiny groups, one with memory and one without. So you have subtype differences, you have societal differences, and I guess the third aspect I'm gonna just let go. <laughs> okay. Oh, no. I think maybe we have time for one more question. Does someone have the microphone? No, I'll ask later. If anybody who has a question that I ha can't answer, we, can I stay after? I know I'm not supposed to do this, but just five minutes. She has I'll a dinner date. Oh, um, I'll try to be quick. So one of the issues is, you know, I'm, you're, you sound a little more bullish about technology. And uh, I've been, I was on a panel with Kathy Davidson years ago, and yeah. Kathy Davidson was uh, known for giving all the students at Duke the iPod when the iPod came mm -hmm. out. And she had this whole argument about digital natives, they'll be able yeah. to yeah. do all this stuff. And, and she then cited Mark Rakel and said, oh, you know, Mark Rakel says the brain talks to itself. And I was like, oh, that's not, so I was on this panel, I said, yeah. you know, thousands of years of evolution, the human brain hasn't changed that quickly. And yeah. I, you know, yeah. the, that Definitely. we have very slow attention processes. So I, yeah. I, I, but in that there's also, on the information piece mm -hmm. that you speak about is mm -hmm. this notion of uh, why I think print um, you know, we have so many things that we get from printed books mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, you think of this dual coding memory. We know yeah. what it was about, but we also have this tangible object to, to touch with Which it, right? Which is spatial memory. Right, but, it's, it, but even more than that, right, uh, David Rapp and others have, have talked yeah. about, you know, you yeah. don't, uh, that people will see lots of things on digital media mm -hmm. and, and they won't remember what, who was, you know, mm -hmm. what was the source of this information. Right. Right. So even when told this right. piece is from bad information and this yeah. piece is from good information, yeah. right? When you have that mm -hmm. print, mm -hmm. you're able to have that. And then you think about the generation effect, right? The idea yeah. that, it, you know, yeah. how many of the books that we get from the library have little notes in the, in the yes. you know, written on them, yes. right? Yes. And I, I think that there's so much of, of what, you know, and maybe, you know, with the Kindle, maybe they'll, you know, make writing in the margins something that we do again. But mm -hmm. yeah, I think that there's so many things that, uh, that are missing from print. Absolutely. That, that digital can't provide or digital yeah. is not, our, our brains are not wired to adapt to. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Can I say I agree with everything you said? I really do. I, I, there's so much more than what I've, I, I tried to put in Reader Come Home, some of the multiple sources of information about all that print gives. So it's really important. And, and when I said spatial, one of the things that people don't realize is that the kinesthetic and the spatial aids memory and the consolidation of memory. And that those little annotations are doing motor cortex, which it consolidates in memory too. So there's so many things that are involved. Adam and I have talked about this. So, you know, you, you, I will just say as a gloss, there's, there's almost like a set, a, a seller and a subseller of research under what you've said. And I've tried to bring some of it to, to bear, but there, Naomi Barron has done a really good job as well. And, but there's so much more than, than what I'm able to say in an hour. But thank you, thank you. And so many more questions I wish we could answer, but I think we're out of time. So please give a hand again to Marianne Wolf. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you.